Right. So we've been working on motifs and little things to, you know, kind of get you guys comfortable with, you know, some of the punching tools and just, you know, how the program functions. And, you know, and if you went into and played with, you know, this little corral portion, you know, you now know that this has some pretty nifty things. Um, you know, one of which is being able to create a running stitch line without you really having to think about it and just boom, it's done, which can then be turned into a motif or a design or whatever you want to turn it into. And, you know, these tools, we'll play a little bit more with this down the road, but you've got some neat little tools here and they, they have different little functions. So if you get a chance, you know, maybe you play with this, like even just a simple star is, you know, really not a simple star. Um, you've got these nodes that are going to let you do different things with it. See? Oh, okay. So, you know, don't, you know, don't forget to play in here, but even like, you know, even if you're not real comfortable with this, um, you can, you know, there's the font option, right? And sometimes, you know, sometimes dealing with the fonts in here is a little bit easier than dealing with the fonts, um, you know, in the other side of the program, right? You have all of your open face fonts and your true type fonts. O is open face, right? And T is true type font. We were just working on um, a font that's called Sea Life. And the reason is it's a wingding font, but it's one of the, the fonts that really you can do, you know, something with. It's all capital letters, which is why only the T is actually showing up here. But, you know, there's some pretty interesting um, designs here in this. Okay. So what we were working on is we were actually working on H and the I. And, you know, right now she's pretty little, right? Right. But I can make her bigger, let me get this out of text, I can make her bigger by dragging, right, or, um, you know, by using the font option. I'm zoomed out too far, I didn't want to quite make her that big, but, you know, this is just a font, right? And, you know, if I use this program and open up this odd little font, a, I can click on this and rotate, you know, that's the same as in the other program, you know, or I can convert to curves. Okay, when I convert this to curves, it's no longer a letter. Okay, now I can come in here and me ungroup, I think it's probably grouped, break curve apart. Okay, so. I might have to do something else on this. As you can see, you know, now this is no longer a letter. I'm not going to get a text option, right? right. Looking to see if it'll let me break some things apart. But it may not let me break her apart quite. Oh, yeah, it does. There it goes. If you click off to the side, you can get rid of things like, you know, maybe I decided I don't really need these pieces, right? Or, you know, this piece. It doesn't enhance the design to me. Um, I could even color this if I wanted to. You know, I can select this and I can say, okay, that's flesh. And if I hold the shift key, I just want to make sure I'm getting her face. If I hold the shift key, I can select multiple things with the control key. I think it's just the shift key. Let me try the control key. Yeah, it's just the shift key. Um, and that'll select the shift key in the program selects things in a sequence. The shift key in the graphics portion selects things separately. Okay, but you can see like why coming in here and, you know, removing things or changing things or coloring them in makes it a little bit easier. Like, you know, what do you want to do with these pieces? Are they going to be part of the waves or um, you're going to get rid of them? But I'm going to hold, go ahead and hold the shift key. See, I can select multiple things there, and I can select these pieces here. And I can just keep clicking shift to select the pieces I want and color them. And I'll give you this. I'm going to send you 
a link to download the font within do you guys know how to install fonts? Yes. Okay. Um I think you, in depends on which Windows version you have. You can usually just right click on it and install it. But um I'll see if I can find some instructions and send those over as well. Okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and you know, this is going to be subjective. Like, you know, do you think this is part of her hair? Do you think this is part of the wave? You know, do you really need this piece back here at all? And those are the things that, you know, only you can make those decisions, right? Does it enhance or not enhance the design? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, for this example, I'm going to say that these pieces are going to be part of the wave. Okay, so now I've got the wave all colored, right? And, you know, this piece, I'll make that part of the wave as well. But this piece, I'm going to make part of her hair. And we've decided she's going to have red hair, but we'll go for brown for right now. Okay, see what's going on? And then these pieces here, you know, you can do some editing, like, you know, these little small pieces, right? Let me zoom up real close. See these little, you know, this is a curve, right? But see the node? If I drag this over here and I, you know, if you lose it, just click on again. There's these little anchors that let me determine, you know, how much curve there is to something, right? So I could, you know, blend some of these things together. Now, just because I put them together, in this program does not mean that the program when you take it in is going to see them as one right you have to select the pieces with your shift key and right now i've got those two pieces i've just put together selected right and let me see if it gives me the tools to let me right click sometimes right clicking gives you you know there's a combine and that's now turned that into one piece okay and that's how the program will see it is one piece and same thing with this like you have to decide you know these could all be one piece right this could be one piece you know so you know you uh, all it is is just selecting this going over to the reshape vector is what it's called and zoom in but you know, you're going to see when you mouse over. If you can't see anything, you're going to see them when you mouse over. You can just pull them down. Use your arrows to reshape as desired. And, you know, even like on something like this where there's this little funny thing. See where there's that little funny pull there? These arrows will straighten that out. See how that's gone now? And then from there, it's just a matter of going back to select, holding the shift key, selecting the first one, selecting the second one, right click, and combine. See, now that's one piece. And, and you know, it, it, what it does is it makes it a better design. You have fewer jumps, right, and fewer problems. But it's also good to play with these tools because then you know how to clean up you know, an image that you get that's not that good or that has a funny little thing or something that happens. See that little tail right there? See the tail right there? Mm -hmm. That has to do with these arrows, see? And, you know, so you can kind of clean up some of your artwork, which will give you a better result in the program. So it kind of comes down to this. You're going to either edit more here, which is a little more controllable sometimes, or edit more in the program, right? So I'm going to go ahead and merge these pieces together, and then we'll just take her and we'll put her in the program. Don't forget to right-click because you have different menu options, all right? So there's a girl. Let me get her. These are uh, one piece I missed. I'll turn that one blue. I think it's the same blue. Yeah. And, you know, her hair, I'll just grab her hair real quick and color her in. 
And I might blend more or clean up that, that piece of hair a little bit. And we were using brown. By the way, your scroll wheel is what zooms you in and out in the program. But it doesn't enlarge it or shrink it down? Um, just the image. Okay, so we've got her hair done. Now we're just down to, you know, the little starfish. Those are quick. Just grab one, hold the shift key. In a graphics program, when you hold shift, it allows you to select multiple things. The digitizing program is a little bit different. I'm going to go ahead and make these, we'll just make them kind of flat gold. We can always change the color when we get in there, right? So now we've got this font that we turned into an image. And I'm going to show you why it's easier to turn it into an image than use it as a font in the program. I mean, you can still do that in the program, but we've, you know, not done a whole lot of work on this. We deleted things. We kind of blended things together. You know, I might move that hair closer, but I can do that in the program. Um, you know, so we've got this pretty good vector image now. Now, what you want to do is go File, Save As, and, you know, you have a choice. Uh, you know, let me cancel and go back. Sorry. I always forget. It's File, Export. So you're going to export this, right? And it gives you WMF as an option, right? It also gives you Illustrator. Go for the Illustrator format, okay? Or, you know, don't go for Photo Paint, but, you know, go for, you know, one of these. You either want an AI, which keeps a completely vector, right? Because you can open it and import it back into this program, but it keeps a very clean vector. Um, I'm looking to see if they gave you the Corel format in here. You know, but don't be fooled by the Corel, you know, presentation, you know, what you want is, you know, the Corel photo paint is not what you want. They don't seem to give us really a Corel format in here. So I would go for AI and, you know, give her a name. Right after you click on that area again. <laughs> I always forget to do that. Then you're looking at it like, oh, you know. Okay, mermaid, right? And she is in Illustrator. That is very vector. That's, you know, just clean vector lines. So we exported her and we saved her. It's going to ask you a whole bunch of questions here. You know, just import text as text. You know, you, if you import text as curves, it becomes an image. We already converted her, but I'm going to select curves anyway. And I'm just going to say OK. So now I have saved this in case something goes wrong. And I can always open her by going to File, Import, and let me select the format of AI, and she will be, where is my mermaid? Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Hold on. I have too many file folders. I suppose I should know where I saved her, huh? I think I saved her here. If not, I'll go back and look. I might have saved her elsewhere. I must have saved her elsewhere. Hold on. File, export. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Hold on. Let me get back here so I know where she is from now on. I cannot type today. Okay, so now we know where she is. We're going back to that is curves, and boom, there she is, right? So now we've saved her just in case. Now, if I just hit select or, you know, if I just go to create embroidery right now, I will just create this part. It's only what's selected. So remember to click off to the side and go to edit. Select all. And let me zoom out a little bit. This says, okay, I just want to make sure she's selected. Okay, so she is entirely 
select it. And, you know, if you want to, you actually could um, group her together by right-click and group. And then this now highlights because I can convert her immediately to embroidery. So I'm going to go ahead and click and let the program do its automatic thing. And ta-da! Other than making some changes, that did a pretty good job. Yes, it did. Now I'm going to have some jumps and I might have to reorganize, right? But, you know, I went out of visualizer so I could see the jump. She's not looking too jumpy. The program does a pretty good job of organizing things. But I can still come in here. Like if you look, you know, if you go to your select tool and you click on her hair pieces, right, you can still get to the individual hair. If I come over here and I look in my sequence view, you can see what it's done with the hair, right? You know, this is, you know, this piece is a little different because I must not have joined it. These pieces joined, but I must not have joined it or hit undo or something in that image. But see, it's combined those pieces, even though it didn't blend them in um, the graphics thing, which, you know, I thought I had done that, but I might have missed that. So, you know, what I've got is I've got her hair. And this piece, you know, when you get something like that, Looking to see what I can do with that because that's actually com yeah I'm not sure why I did I guess because it's a combined thing right but I can actually click on the colors and you can see I've got some colors that are out of place and I can move them into place and we can move these things around later so but for right now I'm just going to kind of drag them into place and I can select those go in here. And, you know, it's giving me this because I have a couple of different things going on. You know, it's seen some things as satin. Um, you know, and if I hit satin right now, I might not quite like what I get. Okay, see how that's, you know, I have to give it a pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just go back in. You know that you've got a satin fill. And, you know, you could come down here to a weed fill if you want, or you can go to a, an embossed fill, or you could go to a contour fill, but, you know, you might not get exactly what you want because of the shapes. But, oh, what the heck, let's see what it looks like, right? And those are the pieces that will let me do in contour, so we'll just done too. And one of the nice things about the program is you really can't do something that won't work. Let's go with embossed. And then we'll look for... I'm just going to kind of grab one of these real quick. So I could potentially, you know, find a pattern that looks a little more like hair, right? Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I've got a design done. You know, I'll come into this blue and I'll change the blue to what I want it to be as well. And that's kind of the boom, there you go, you've got a design or at least something that you can pull in here quickly and work on and that came from a font okay that we converted so let me show you what happens when I use that font um, to create the design because I can still do this in the program and sometimes it might be better and sometimes it's not sometimes it's more work but sometimes you have a little more control maybe over the satin stitching for example for her hair so we're going to go ahead and say let's Insert uh, lettering. Let's go to our fonts here. And I'm going to scroll way down until I find my two type fonts and the one that is named Sea Life. So. I think you passed it. There she is. Okay. So size 10. I'm going to take it as big as possible. We know that she's the capital I. And let's see what it'll do for us in the program. And there she is. So I can make her larger. I can just drag her. And this gives me 
some different options. First off, she is entirely satin stitched. With the other one, you had some turning weave. You know, you had this weave bill, right? Mm -hmm. With this, she is completely satin. And that has pluses and it has minuses. Like, for example, these stars. You know, the stars can't remain satin, you know, with, and look good. Some of these pieces may be a little bit funny, like that one's turned the wrong way, right? But, you know, if this is a better effect for you, you can still edit her. Right now, she is a font. If I, you know, go up to edit, I'm looking to see because there's a way to undo her. Hold on. I thought there was a way. There used to be a way to ungroup her. Looking to see. Hmm. I have to think about this for a minute because I haven't done this for a while, but there used to be a way to um let me just see if it'll let me get to it. Used to be a way to ungroup the text, but it doesn't look like it's gonna let me do that unless I add another letter maybe. And which I can always bump off later, right? Okay, so now I've got two letters and I can always resize them. So let's see if it'll let me ungroup. Now I guess it's just not going to let me do that now. Hmm. Anyway, so you've got, you can see where you've got at least her there. See if there's something in here. Is the turtle a small A? Um, no, it just kind of kicks the turtle in. I'm not sure why. I think he's a large A. It might have just made the whole font, you know, as it is, right? All right. Well, I'm bummed. It used to let you ungroup the letters, which was kind of a nice thing. I could go out and I could say this is a Jeff Lyon pull pack in, but then I don't have as much editing. But anyway, so you can see what happens when you bring her in as a font. On some things, you have a little more control, and on some things, you don't, right? You know, I would come in here and probably make her a satin fill at least, and she's one color, which is okay. You know, I probably have some jumps in here. Not too, too many, though. It's looking pretty good. Right? And I could come in here and I could say, you know, really, satin fill. Now nah, let's make her a weave fill. If I make her a weave fill, or we'll make her a satin fill. Uh, now we'll go ahead and weave her. If I make her a weave fill, all that is is putting a pattern into the satin. Okay? It's not changing it from satin. Does that make sense? Mm-mm, no, I don't didn't understand that. Okay, I'm gonna pick. I'll pick a pattern. See that pattern's pretty stripy, right? If I uh -huh. say weave fill on her, okay. If I say weave fill on her right now, she's entirely satin. That's all she's made of is satin stitches, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So if I say weave fill, see how that's shaped like this? Uh huh. And these are shaped in a satin stitch. It won't change this from a satin stitch. It just puts the pattern into the satin stitch. Does that make sense? Yes. So you're not turning it into a weave fill. It, she'll remain, see here on the body, she will remain a satin stitch. So I'm going to go ahead and say okay. And let's go into 3D view. Would help if I selected her, huh? Mm -hmm. And I just thought of something. I think there was a way to do that in there, but there's not. Okay. So, you know, so I can get something really quick with the letter, right? Boom, it's done. It's got some issues that I, I you know, could kind of come in here and try to edit out a little bit. But there you are. There's a complicated letter. Um, this one, I could make this one color as well. 
you know, but she gives me the potential for a whole lot more interesting effects, right? The absolute best one will be if we use an image. If we come in here and we say an insert, insert the image, get over to my images. And it by default goes to bitmap, so you can go to all files to see what's in here. She has been converted to an image. And she's just one color, right? I could go back into the art program and export her, you know, as a WMF image in color. Okay? So this is what she looks like coming in one color, and I can digitize her as I like. Let me go back over to the art program. I don't think I can bring in AI, but I'll double check on that. Matter of fact, let me go back over here. Sometimes this takes a while. Okay. So, image, insert image. Let me go over to artistic digitizer, and I'm thinking it lets me do AI now, so we'll see what it does. Maybe not. It shows her, but I don't know if it's going to let me import her. No. Okay, so we'll do it this way. If, you know, you want to manually punch, because that's where we're going with this. We're going to use a little automation, and we're going to um, use a little bit of manual punch, because we have a little more control then. But even if we use the automation, we have a little more control doing it in pieces than we would doing it in um, sections. Yeah, I see that broke up. Okay. Anyway. All right. We'll have a little bit of editing to do in that. But, okay, so we're going to export her as a WMS file. Okay, so okay, there she is. All right, so if we bring her in as a WMF file, right, we have complete control over what happens with her. See, I've got these little holes here where she was, her hair was joined. No biggie. We can manually punch those sections, but... I can also use some of the automation to make things happen a little more quickly. Let me get this centered. My mouse is a little jumpy in the webinar, sorry. Okay, so we'll start with the water. But first, we click on the image. And, you know, you've got this, you know, click to design instantly, right? That's not what we want to use. You've got photo click, which is also not what we want to use. You've got these icons down here. See the one with the little hummingbird? Mm -hmm. Okay, that says image preparation. We want to use that one. And it's going to give us another tool that we can use. So I'm going to go ahead and say image prep. And, you know, it's telling me, if you look what's going on here, it's saying, oh, well, you know, we're going to reduce this to four. Well, I might want to try five, you know, see what happens at five. That's what happens. The starfish become the same color as her skin. If I go up to six, I get everything that I want there. So you can adjust these. You know, you might decide that, you know, really three colors is good, right? And that's what you get. So you can play with these, the color numbers here, and it shows you the preview of what it's going to do. So I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, go ahead and edit this. Now, bear in mind, white is a color. Like when that disappeared when I went down to three, it took out the white and blended it with the blue, right? But it did give me three colors, blue, black, and her skin tone. Four colors, blue, white, black, and the skin tone, or the hair, sorry. Five colors, skin tone comes back. Six colors, you know, the gold comes back. So, you know, you have to bear in mind, white is always considered a color in a graphics program, okay? 
I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And now we have prepped the image. And all that does is it takes an image, like if we had a JPEG that had 20 colors in it, it would reduce those colors to make it a, a more digitizable or automatically digitizable design. Does that make sense? It would take out, like if we had 20 colors and we said we want eight, it would take the, the closest color match and turn it to that color. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay, so now all we've really done with her, because she was already pretty clean, was tell the program what it was supposed to look at. So now I've got this tool. It says click to, and it's got this little black flyout triangle. So if I click on that flyout triangle, I get, you know, click to parallel we fill, which is our complex fill. You know, click to um, parallel we fill without holes. So this tells me with that little hole in the apple, that if there's any holes in something, it would notice them. It would make them. Like if the eyes were over top of something, it would make a hole under the eyes, right? This will not. This is click to turning angle satin fill. That's your satin fill. You know, click to center line. So if you had like a wide outline and you wanted to center it, you could use that. Click to outline. So you can outline things with this as well. And then you've got this matched palette, okay? Um, what it's going to do is it's going to use your thread palette that's selected in the program, and it's going to try to match this automatically. If you, you know, click on that, you know, it's kind of already ready to roll. I'm trying to make it not selected. Hold on, these little arrow things fly back in. Okay, so now it's selected, right? So I'm going to go ahead and click to turning angle fill. And I can come over here, see the background is actually a background. It's a color. And I can click on that. Hmm, hold on. You turn that off. Did you ever have one of those days? Mm -hmm. The whole month of July. <laughs> I'm having one of those days because it should just select it. There shouldn't be any reason that it won't. And so far in August. So far in August, I wonder if it's, it shouldn't be because it's vector. That shouldn't be why. Hold on, I'm going to pause this first. I'll play with it later and see. It's got to be something, you know, it's got to be something in this because um, it could be because the recording software. I don't know. But it should just do that. It's been an image process and it should allow me to do that. Like on this one, it's all black and white, right? Reduced to two, black and white. That makes it simple enough. Um, see if it behaves on this one. Yeah, it does on this one. Hmm. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is a JPEG. So, <laughs> anyway, we'll use this image, okay? <laughs> you know, if I go through here, let me undo the thing I did, right? Um I can do a couple of things. Like I can turn on my thread, right? When I use this click to, you know, just turn that off. It doesn't need to be on. And then I can come up here and I can say, okay, you know, peach is a good skin tone color. I want her skin to be, um, you know, just a regular weave fill. There's no hole, so I'm going to go ahead and just select that tool. And then I can say, okay, there's her face. There's her neck her arm, her other arm, you know, her body. And this is subjective. You can, you know, make her body whatever you want it to be. If you want that to be, you know, a different color, you can. But for this, I'm going to go ahead and just say, boom, there you go, right? So there's her skin tones. Now, I still have control over this. 
I can still, you know, come up to the select tool and the editing tools. And, you know, I can come in here and I can say, okay, you know, really, let's, let's zoom in on her face. Um, I want her face to be going in this direction. And, you know, her neck, you know, I really want her neck to be going in this direction. And, you know, maybe a little angle, but, you know, the whole goal is, you know, to get this to, you know, have the light play off it a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the thing. So, you know, so that's really, you know, this, you can collect, you know, you can see the change immediately in the arms. Um, mm. And we'll go in and we'll change the settings at, like, because this is all one fill type we'll change the settings at one time. So, you know, we can say, oh, we're going to stitch on cotton. We can use the automatic things. And let me clean her up. And, yep, that's looking pretty good. Okay, so she's, you know, just the change of direction is going to give this a little more depth, right, in her body. But since that's not really the focal point, I don't want to put a pattern or anything else in it. Um, that's with the automatic. I don't have to do a lot of work in that portion of the design. It's a very, you know, it's not the focal point. It's not going to be satin stitched. So I can use that click to and get something done very quickly. Now, the rest of this I have to think about a little bit. I do have control. I can change in and out points. But remember, we talked about, you know, just ignoring something. So I'll ignore those pieces, right? Um and you have to decide what's the next section you're going to do. And this design is a little bit easier to work with because everything's so broken up, right? So even if I decide I want to do the blue, which is kind of on top of this, I still have plenty of room to work with the tail, right? You know, it's not going to make any difference what order I go in other than you should try to work from the center out as much as possible on a design. Um, just to adjust your compensation properly. So, you know, with that being said, you could do her hair next, or you could begin these wave sections here, and either would be okay. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and we'll work on the wave sections because I'm going to let you work on the hair. And remember how we combined these in the graphic? Mm -hmm. You can combine them digitizing. You know, just look at these and decide, do you really need this piece right here? This piece and this piece could be one. These pieces could be one. You know, so it's kind of up to you. This piece right here coming into the little curl could be one, right? Mm -hmm. And then you look at this little piece back here. Is it really worth the jump, you know, for the, the wave? And those are the things that you have to decide. But when you go to, you know, punch these, some of these you can get away with that punching. Some of them you aren't going to have any choice. And this piece right here, I can actually come over here, and I can see how this goes. You know, that's the satin stitch, and come over here and say, click, and, oh, yeah, that looks pretty good, and oops, I forgot to change my color, right? Just select it, come in and select a blue, and, you know, go up here and begin to look at the different patterns. Now, these are actually in the Manual, the online manual, you can look and see what a lot of these look like. But the embossed fills are really like a satin stitch with somebody punching a stamp into them. Some of them look better in one direction or another. But they all can kind of create some really neat things. You can see you can change these sizes here to get even different effects. But, you know, with that in mind, you know, you're going to have to kind of scroll through these or look through the pattern book to see what these look like. You can just leave that open and arrow down. And, you know, as you're looking, there's some really neat patterns here. I want to kind of scroll down to the wave patterns. Um, see the ziggy patterns here? I guess I missed the wave somewhere. There it is, splash. There's splash, there's splash too. That might be something good for her tail. Um, you know, see these patterns like this? That actually does like a almost a weave 
or complex fill with these satin pieces to it. So it's really kind of interesting. You know, the oval fills are kind of interesting. You have to decide what you like or what, you know, speaks to you of water, right? There's a snail. You know, I always thought the snail was kind of cool. And you can resize these patterns. On a pattern like this, be very careful about resizing and respacing. Because even though I can get some really neat effects, I can also put several thousands of stitches into an area that I don't want to. So I'm going to go ahead and select that one. And you can see what the effect is, right? And if you don't quite like how something's forming, you have editing tools. Remember, this is satin stitching, which means that if I go into my reshape, I'm going to be able to see not only the nodes that reshape it, but the direction lines for the satin. So I can kind of control how this is waving. I can control the direction. And, you know, give it more angle or less angle. Okay? So, you know, a lot of these you can do with the automation. But there are going to be some areas that you're going to want to manually punch. One of them, you know, is going to be the tail. I'm going to leave you guys with these. You should practice manual punching. Sometimes you get a cleaner effect. But the tail is going to be complicated because here's her body, right? And then this tail, there's no way to do a satin stitch in entirety on this tail. You just can't do it, right? If I come over here and, I, you know, I'll select it with this just so you can see what it looks like. See, you got this funny little split thing going on. It just looks kind of funky, right? And there's really no way to, to in particular fix that split other than to use the manual punching tool. So this is going to be a good practice thing for you, right? I'm going to select your tail, get rid of it, and... Once you get through some of these other pieces and these smaller pieces in her hair, right, where you might manually punch those together, I want you to work on the tail. And the tail is going to be a little bit of a challenge. You might want to do the top portion first and then rearrange things. But the tail, you could do it so this piece comes up. But, you know, I look at it and I think this piece is all one piece. But you could do it that this piece is all one piece. Yeah, it really is, you know, kind of up to you, right? But when you start punching, one thing that you have to know, some programs autocorrect. This program, I do not believe autocorrects unless they change that. Let me double check something. Nope, does not autocorrect. So when you begin satin punching it, you punch this like you would sew a zigzag, one side to the other, one side to the other, right? And, you know, that's how you have to think of this. You should start on one side and work to the other and try to keep track. And you'll notice if you don't, because if you've messed up on this, right, you'll get crisscrosses. Right clicks give you curves. They don't look like curves right now, but as you begin to move and you, you know, are clicking right or left clicks, those curves, see that straight line, will begin to form. That's called a Bezier curve. And this you can actually, you know, you'll you'll get a little thrown on some of these curves. But see what's happening? You kind of want to be careful not to jam too many stitches into an area. But see how, you know, see how that automatically adjusts. I might have to adjust a little bit in here. But, you know, when you're punching, try not to jam too many stitches into a curved, like that inside curve, right? And you will know if you mess up because you'll get this look. Some cross lines, just backspace, backspace. And you know, come back and do these. And I'm going to do what I think is, you know, the top portion of her tail first, which means when I come down here, I have to think about this. You know, I want to make sure that I would be covering anything that was underneath. So I would probably come across like this, and you're going to have to reshape 
her tale kind of based on your imagination. And if you don't think you are going to like the next point, just come back and, you know, backspace and reset it, right? Okay. Are you okay. just right-clicking? I am right-clicking through almost the entire thing. And the reason is a left-click gives me very, very straight points. So uh -huh. this is all curves. So I'm just uh -huh. right-clicking. I right-clicked at the beginning. And I'm right clicking all the way up to the end here. And, you know, just trying to make sure that I go from one point to another. So I'm going to right click and see I have spaces points pretty close together. And I'm going to hit enter. And let me zoom out and change the color of this. We'll change her. I'll make her tail line green just so you can see it. Okay. This is why you have to be careful about where you place points but if you've got the shape of things and this is looking pretty good you know don't don't panic you can always edit you just go into select select the tail and when you click on reshape zoom in and you can see I'm going to go out of 3d view if you go out of your preview you'll be able to see the lines and you can adjust these lines to get a little different angle or two uncongest like maybe an area like in here, right? Okay, I see how that kind of uncongested that area mm -hmm. right there. And if you come down here, like, and you look and think, oh, maybe I should have, uh, you know, maybe made that tail. These, you know, little gold squares, or like a gold square here, which was a left click. These smaller squares are going to let you adjust the angle. See? This blue circle or the gold, like yellow square, are going to let you reshape the area. Okay, see the difference? That blue one's going to let me reshape the area where these little orangey gold kind of small squares are going to let me re-angle or reshape the stitch direction. See that gold square right there? That's a square point. It's going to be the same thing as the inside node that's going to let me reshape something. Okay, so, you know, there is... You know, my mermaid tail, the first part of my mermaid tail, right? right? And the reason I did it this way is, to me, it's easier to do the this section on something this complicated, to do her tail section first, and then do that bottom section so I can better align it, and then just rearrange the stitching order in my in and out points, right? Now, with satin stitching, see this little square right here? When you're doing the turning angle or satin stitching, where I start is going to be my end point, and where I stop is my out point. I can move those. So if I know I'm going to do this piece and tuck it underneath, I might as well take this green square, which is my end point, and put it down here. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay, so now all I have to do is worry about is, you know, punching the rest of this tail. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, click off to the side, make sure nothing's selected, and then go back to this turning angle fill. And the same thing, I'm going to, you know, right-click, right-click, because it's a curve. You know, I'm starting on a curve, and I want to continue to curve, and I'm just right-clicking the whole way here. Um, you'll find you use more right-clicks than left-clicks unless you have, like, a severe corner or a point or you need to, to just completely stop the curving and see how much easier that is to accurately punch the tail. Okay, there's the extra fin and let me change it to the lime green and I can come over to the resequence bar and let me move my in and out points because here's my end point. My out point's over here. I can just drag that over there, and I can just drag that above the tail. 
So now I've got the tail done. Um, and by the way, don't panic. Like when you see something like on your screen, see the stitches that are in here? See those stitches? They look like they're pulling back right here. Yes. They are pulling back, but they're underneath the top layer. It's called stitch shortening, and it's done so that you don't have twice as many stitches in a tight curve as you do on the outside of the curve. So it gives you an overall better stitch quality and, you know, less warping in a tight curve, right? So don't panic when you see that. That's, you know, just perfectly normal, and it should not show up in your stitch out. So I'm going to go ahead and, you know, we'll spiff up the tail a little bit, and I can do this real quick. I can just click on the green um, in my sequence view and select everything that's lime green, which I know is her tail, right? And I can go up here to my properties, and I can say, oh, you know, she's a weed fill right now, even though she's really satin. But, well, let's go with that embossed fill, and let's see, you know, there was that Saturn one, which was kind of cool. There was the squiggles. Uh, there was a Target one that's kind of neat. And, you know, I can kind of dress her up a little bit. And if I want to get really spiffy, um, I can come over to the resequence bar, select. I'm just going to select one piece, right? And I'll select the bottom piece. I can go to edit and duplicate it, which drops it right on top of this. Change the color. And I'm going to pick, uh, oh, we'll pick, we might as well go for the total 50s or, yeah, I guess 50-ish colors, right? And come into here, keep the pattern, right? Turn off your underlay. Go over to gradient and pick a fill. Okay, now you'll you see this line here. That's going to show up. You're going to want to change your in and out points. If you don't, you know, like that, if you don't think it's deep enough, um, gradient's hard to tell on the screen. You know, try a different one. These are your settings. You know, this is the minimum stitch length. That's the maximum. You could drop that down a little bit if you want to, but I should warn you, you should probably stitch it first. Gradient is incredibly difficult to tell really what it's going to look like in a 3D preview because what's going to happen is because I left the pattern and I duplicated this, these pink lines are going to drop right into the stitching or come pretty close to dropping into the stitching over top of it. You go ahead and so you can see that's that's maybe a little better preview of what that might look like. So you could actually blend some things or put a metallic thread in and put a little metallic shimmer. You know, you can do all kinds of neat things and um we're talking about that one little funky run line. Let me go back to the the darker color so you can see it. See the running line? There's not always a lot you can do about that. You can go up to your um, reshape, find your in and out points, and we know that, you know, our original in and out points were up here. And the minute I reestablish that original in point for that second layer up here, see the line disappears? Here's my endpoint, right? Remember we moved the original tail endpoint to down here? Mm -hmm. So because, you know, I started punching up here, the program kind of records that, and Satin Stitch has a logic to it. So what it does is it says, okay, I'll travel to your endpoint that you defined. But if I want to get rid of that line underneath an open fill like this, then all I have to do is really move that, in point back to the original, and that line disappears. So, let me go back to the teal and see honey. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so you can do the same thing in her hair, but you're not going to want to do that too awful much. Um, you know, and, and honestly, sometimes the more plain the fill, 
you know, sometimes the nicer the effect. Like if I go back to my weave fill and pick a pattern like that, you might be surprised at the, the overall effect with the stitching. And then you could put something in here, or you could do it the opposite, a man do. You could have this filled in with a different fill. To make it, you know, kind of stand out, or just take it back to the weave fill, and you've got some choices in the weave fill. If you scroll through these, you know, you can see the different patterns. You guys have any questions? Um, when, when you added the gradient. Um, could we see the objects um, in the the resequence? Sure. Okay, here's so, the blue water that I, you know, we played right. with first. Okay, there's the bottom tail right there. Right. Okay, here's the top tail. And then... Okay. This is the duplicated layer to this tail. And literally all I do is select the tail and go up to duplicate and it drops it right on top of it. Okay, and so that's going to stitch the right same exact time. object, but only with a diff, with the um, gradient fill over your, mm -hmm. your weave fill. Okay, all right. right. And that's that's what's so nice about it. Like gradient is very difficult to actually see on the screen. Let me hide the picture. What it should do. Let me change that back to some really loud color too. What it should do. See how it's dropping, like, right into the same stitching lines? Mm -hmm. So if I changed the direction or, you know, adjusted the um, stitching directions for the satin fill, it would be more pronounced on top of this layer. But because it's, you know, blending with the same direction, same pattern, it's just going to kind of drop into the stitching a little bit more so it's not going to be so in your face it'll be a nice subtle shading and the stitching won't be too thick with the two objects stitched on it top shouldn't because we've taken underlay out of this it'll be a little heavier and you could lower this density if you wanted but you wouldn't want to lower it too much you know okay. i wouldn't maybe put it more than maybe four three four or five at the most, right? And the reason is, if you look at what the settings are on this gradient, let's go into the settings there. Okay, what it's telling you here is the maximum, and I remember I bumped this up, right? The maximum spacing or the maximum density that I'm telling this it's allowed to have is one millimeter, or one, sorry, I shouldn't say. Well, yeah, it is one millimeter. So it's one millimeter between each line is the maximum. The minimum spacing is 0.8 millimeters. Our standard density is 0.4. So this is a pretty open fill. Okay. And, you know, and if you're worried about it being too heavy, you can always adjust this, um, you know, like maybe 1.5. The default is two. Okay. Okay, and you can see, you know, the difference with two. But do a test stitch because gradient shading is notoriously difficult to really gauge on a 3D preview. Sometimes you are better off looking at it in this view and you get a better idea of how it's going to actually blend. And the reason is, is you know, when you go into the preview um, or the visualizer, you mean you you get they're trying to show you the thread. So of course this is the top layer, so it's a little heavier than what it would actually stitch like, especially when it falls into that pattern. So you guys have any? Oh, go ahead. And that bottom tail, that bottom uh -huh. fin. Uh, when mm -hmm. you put take it out of the um, take it out of the preview mode 
and that, right, and then that won't be too thick where it overlaps, or is it, should it be thicker? Um, like, you could adjust this, like I overlapped quite a bit in uh -huh. here, uh -huh. and you're going to adjust your density anyway, like, see where this is, I could, you know, I could come up to the outline and left click to make a point and kind of straighten that around, mm -hmm. but I want to be careful. Um, it's satin, this is satin, it's going to pull, and, you know, so I, I want to be careful not to underdo it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and I can't really curve it, like I can't come in here and put a curve in, because the satin just won't handle it. You know, I can't, I'll end up like with two little funky pieces over here, right? So. This is, if we go back to like what our 100% view is, right? And I'm going to make that deep red so you can see it. It's not nearly as thick or as overlapped as what you think. Uh -huh. But since I need to make sure that this has enough here and that has enough, that's about the overlap I'm going to end up with, see here. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it should be okay. I mean, you may have a little ridge here. But it's not going to be anything that's significant. And, you know, here's here's 100% view. You aren't even going to notice that. <laughs> now, if I put two layers on there, you might. You know, it would be a little heavier. But, um, you know, you're not going to notice that overlap. And with satin stitching, here's what happens. You know, I could make that just a regular fill and not worry about it, but I won't have as much flow. But... If I'm doing satin stitching and I'm going across like I did here, right? I can't um I can't really do this. I can't, you know, kinda connect here and without that line coming across. No matter what. See where you know, see how that's it's just gonna be a straight line basically. Even though I put that extra point in, I'm still gonna have a straight line. Mm-hmm. You know, satin stitching will let me curve. If I do something like this, I can make points. You know, I can go outwards, and I can kind of come inwards as long as I'm, you know, coming back out, right? What I can't do, I can do curves on top. You know, and I can do, you know, curves on the bottom, right? What I can't do is a curve like an arc here. And let me see if I can show you what happens. What happens is it, it just completely breaks up the satin stitching. Mm -hmm. And that's actually overlapping, but man, do that because that's not quite what I wanted to do. Uh, okay, let's try to curve this up. See, it's just going to, you can see what it's doing. It's overlapping. Mm -hmm. And you know, so, you know, I'm kind of limited by the restraints of that particular fill in that area. But I should be okay that way. Um, I could maybe shorten it up a little bit here, but I really want to make sure that that's covered and that this is covered well. Because this is satin stitch and it's going to pull, you know, in this direction. Which brings us to kind of our next thing. I put no underlay on, you know, the, uh, let me change it back to lime so we don't get confused. I put no underlay on this part, you know, this gradient shaded part because it would show. But I need to think about what underlay needs to go into these pieces. And these pieces are a little bit different. This is small and this is big. And satin stitch always pulls a little bit more. So there's a couple things I want to look at. I want to look at my stretchiness, and it should be at six which is the max. You can increase that, but that should be fine. Then I want to look at the underlay. And what I've got is an edge run and a weave. Okay? And what the underlay is supposed to do is the edge run is supposed to kind of hold the backing in place and the fabric in place to eliminate pull. The weave should go in the opposite direction as much as possible from the fill. But this stitch length drives me crazy. I almost always change it to three because two is a very small stitch length. Mm -hmm. So 
You know, I'm going to go ahead and change that stitch length. That's the edge run. The weave, it says my density is, you know, my stitch length is 4. My spacing is 2.8. You could change that to 3 if you want. It's not significant, but, um, you know, here's what we've got. I want to go through the player real quick and show you what's on the tail. So let's zoom out. And just for the sake of showing you what's on the tail real quick, I'm going to bump off her body parts in the blue and just, you know, kind of get us to the tail real quick. Okay, so here's what we've got on the tail. Kind of speed through that one. Okay, there's the weave underlay, see? Now, it should go perpendicular to your stitches. So there's your edge, and, you know, it's, going the same direction as the stitch. Okay, it's going to put some steps in there, but it's going the same direction as that stitch, right? So you have to be, you know, you have to kind of know what that is going to do. And your options on underlay in this program are, you know, kind of limited. You know, I've got the edge run, right? And I've got the weave. I've got a weave weave. That's more for like a grid for toweling. I've got an edge run and a double zigzag. That's going to be even, you know, a little more of a pull. But, you know, so your option is really edge run weave, and you have to know what it's going to do. It's really going to go in the same direction instead of going in the opposite direction like it should. Like on a normal fill, let me just make a quick square here. On a normal fill, what happens is this. You kind of zoom through these babies. Okay, just bear in mind, look at the direction on that for a second. You'll see what I mean when I say on a normal fill. Okay. See the direction that that, fill, that underlay is going right now, right? Yeah. Okay. The fill type is going to be exactly perpendicular to it. See? Okay. And that's a balancing function for underlay. So when you, you know, we talked about like this overlap here. When you've got satin stitching, it pulls more. And when you've got the underlay going in the same direction, even though that underlay will help, you know, with some of the compensation, when it's going in the same direction, you've got, more pull in that direction. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever done like an underlay or an applicamine and, you know, you do the placement, you do the tack down, and, um, you know, you trim the applique, and then they put like a bunch of stitches on top, and then you do the satin stitch. And somewhere between the bunch of stitches on top and that satin stitch cover, the fabric is shifted? Mm-hmm. And it has to do with those stitches on top pulling the fabric. That the compensation. Pull. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, you know, that's when you have a satin stitch area like this, you know, to me, that it, it, try it and see what you think, right? Because it does kind of depend on your machine, too. But for the most part, that's probably adequate um, overlay, even though I have compensation going on, too. So it's, um, you know, it's kind of the push-pull compensation is, uh, you know, pull compensation is easy to understand. It's pulling, like in these, you know, the satin stitch, right? Um, the push compensation is a little harder to understand, but if you can start with, like, the pull compensation and understanding how to balance that, you know, with the other stitches, then... You know, that helps a lot. Then you'll kind of get a feel of when you should overlap more or less on a design. So, you guys have any more questions? Shirley is very quiet. Um, Shirley, you still there? <laughs> I'm just thinking and trying to follow. It's, um, you'll, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recorder now.